The College of Complexes will now come to order. Hey, let's, let's, let's get it. Let's, the College of Complexes will now come to order. Tim, I'm the unofficial videographer for the organization. For those of you who want to, uh, the College of Complexes is a very brief format. We have a speaker who speaks. We have a question and answer period and a brief rebuttal. Okay, let's get our speaker on, Brown. Now we've shown here from Bill Lee. Oh, we've got to start it. Bill? Yay! Hi, Dave! I've got our speaker. Somebody's got your Bill? We have uh, our... How about an introduction? He already has done it. Let's get him speaking. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me uh, read something that I got the last time I was here back in January, I'm told. Okay. This was handed to me by a uh, person. It says, as of January 30th, 2015, any military veteran or law enforcement official in America who still promotes the official 9-11 fairy tale is involved in obstruction of justice. Are you intentionally involved in the promotion and cover-up of a huge crime against humanity? Ignorance can be cured with a quick perusal of the forensic evidence, but continued promotion of the 9-11 myth is obstruction of justice. It's just that simple. So I'm wondering if the person who gave that to me or anyone else, uh, are you prepared to arrest me now? Or are you going to call somebody else to do it? Because as you can see, I am a military veteran. Let me tell you, I'm just here representing myself, no one else. No one paid me to be here unless you count the free meal I just had. Now, are there any truth seekers here? Who do you want, Boy Scout? Yeah. Got one? Got two? Yeah. Got three truth seekers. Okay. Well, I would say just uncross your arms, relax, and open your minds to truth, reality, the real world. No minds at all. Now, I want to be taking questions, because I enjoy answering questions and clear up misunderstandings. Uh, you'll be given 15 seconds for each question. Otherwise, you go past that, you're not asking a question, you're giving a statement. We know that. Now, recently, I read an article about the surprise attack on the United States that occurred more than a decade ago. Let's see. A well-planned and brilliantly executed surprise attack by aircraft was launched against the United States. The government, its senior leaders, its commanders had sufficient information to be adequately warned that an attack was possible and had time to be prepared to thwart or blunt the blow. The information was largely ignored. The preparations were utterly inadequate. That was from an article in American Heritage, February 1962. You know, about every decade, we get surprised by some kind of uh, great turmoil, disaster. The real surprise is that we're ever surprised when something new happens. Just about, well, you look back in history of the last century, May 7, 1915. Lusitania was sunk by a German submarine, killing 1,198. And that was a month after the German government explicitly warned the world that their ships could be subject to attack. The Day of Infamy, 1941, where 2,400 sailors, soldiers, and civilians died. North Koreans attacked south. Korea in 1950, 
took the Allies completely by surprise, overwhelmed our forces, and pushed them all the way down to the bottom of the peninsula. October 1983, 241 Marines were killed by a truck bomb in Beirut. The Tet Offensive, 1968, the Vietnamese New Year, took the Allies completely by surprise. Their intelligence, for the most part, didn't see it happen, although there were warning signs. The U.S. Embassy was overrun, 1979, took everybody completely by surprise, didn't see it happen. Held hostage for 444 days. Mogadishu, 1993. Big bad United States government thinks they can go anywhere. Kick butt. Killed 19 soldiers. Then there's the jihadist attacks of the 1990s. 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, North Tower. That should be North Tower. Thing is, there were people who wanted to prepare the World Trade Center and have better security. But of course their warnings were unheeded. Cobar Towers, where the Air Force was set up in Saudi Arabia, killing 20. The 1998 embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, Tanzania killing 224 total. And then the USS Cole in the year 2000, killing 17. Then the events of September 11, 2001. North Tower, South Tower, Pentagon, Pennsylvania Field. Now after knowing all this, that we're surprised every time, you still want to be a conspiracy theorist, right? All right. This is how you do it. First of all, only single source information. Don't ever dig deeper into the real facts. Just go with the first thing that you see that supports your theory. Yeah. Avoid any media that contradicts your theory. You need to call people names of who disagree with you. Here's a good uh, sampling of that. I like that word. For good measure, you should question the motives of those who disagree with you. You're a criminal. You're obstructing justice. You're being paid off. You're just as scared to admit the truth. The added benefit, that will make you feel morally superior. Now remember, any coincidence, it's part of the conspiracy. There's two methods of discovery, scientific method and the conspiracy method. So the scientific method will postulate a theory, and then we'll try to gather facts to support our theory. Of course, the conspiracy method you're going to attack anything. And you create your own facts to support your theory. Scientific method, you're going to try and tear down and break apart that theory to make sure it's true. On the other hand, if you're trying to support the conspiracy, you don't want to hear anything that contradicts you. All right. Scientific method is going to go to the source documents. In other words, they're not going to go to a newspaper report, the TV report. They're going to find out the source of those reports and talk to the actual people involved in whatever activity. Of course, this conspiracy method, we're just going to go with secondhand sources and rumors. And then, if you're scientific, you're going to go with the preponderance of evidence. Okay, you can't always know the truth 100%. Sometimes you can. But of course, the conspiracy method, we're just going to go with that one thing that supports your theory and reject everything else. So let's take an easy example, the Pentagon. The conspiracy way of looking at things. No plane hit the Pentagon. Well, gee, you know, there was a people stuck in traffic all around the Pentagon, and they actually saw a plane fly over, go in the Pentagon. Oh, but it wasn't a 757. Well, no, actually, there was an airline pilot. He said he saw the 757 go into the Pentagon. In fact, somebody who was on the Pentagon lawn, he was a firefighter, worked at the Pentagon, next to the helip heliport. And the plane flew right past the heliport into the building. 
Well, Alan Wallace was with his partner walking away, and they see the plane coming right at him. They run for about two steps, and the plane impacts. Alan Wallace worked at the uh, Reagan National Airport, so he was familiar with aircraft. And he actually called it in. The first person to call in the impact, he jumped in the fire truck, got on the radio. He said, we have a commercial carrier crash into the west side of the Pentagon. The crew is okay. The airplane was a 757 Boeing or a 320 Airbus. That was amazing. I couldn't tell the difference between a 787, 737, 767, 757, Dreamliner. But he actually knew the difference. Other people saw the plane go over. In fact, of recorded witnesses, and there's many, many more than this, just recorded witnesses that was gathered together about a decade ago, this is how many people actually saw the plane hit the Pentagon. This many actually saw that it was an American Airliners, and etc. Now, how many people saw a missile? That many. And some people say a plane didn't hit the Pentagon. See, it's the preponderance of evidence versus your fantasy. So the Pentagon was hit by the airliner just about ground level. The Pentagon's a building about 71 feet high, five stories, and five rings. The rings of the Pentagon start out from the inner court and goes A, B, C, D, E. So it hit the E <coughs> ring on the Pentagon. And then uh, finally came to rest at the outside wall of the C ring. So it went through three rings. And then there's a driveway between the C and the B, and that's where uh, all the debris, a lot of the debris ended up. <clears throat> but then the conspiracy theory will say, well, you know, there wasn't any evidence of a plane. No, not much. Where's those parts that break away in a large crash? Um, I don't know, maybe these things? Oh, they were planted. Yeah, there's a thousand people on the highway, and somebody came and planted it in all the confusion. You know, nobody's ever came forward to admit that they saw people planning things. But then, of course, they're too scared to admit the truth. They'll ask, where's the steel landing gear? Oh, um, right there. Well, but it, well, you can't say it was a Boeing 757. That wheel doesn't prove it's a 757. Well, actually, yeah, if you compare the wheels, you know, from a 757, that's, that's the wheel. Well, but the engine part's not from a 757. Well, actually, you know, you compare the different parts, and it does come from a 757. Well, the engine is like six feet wide, and all you have is this little... Hub. Well, yeah. By the way, Thank you. I have a little more experience than the average person because I was actually a jet engine mechanic. I've taken apart jet engines, put them back together. So what you're seeing there is the hub man minus the fan blades. So yeah, the hub, that's what it is, and fan blades will give you another three feet. So there's a multiple uh, pieces of evidence that the Pentagon was hit by Flight 77. One telling piece of evidence, if you read the account, is most of the victims suffered from burns. Why they suffer from burns? Because the jet fuel, which flew all over the place and ignited, a lot of people were covered in jet fuel as well. Uh, you might have a question about those 80, anybody have a question about, what about those 85 videos that the Pentagon uh, confiscated? No questions? Nobody ever had a question about that? Yeah. About that. You had a question about the 85 videos? What about that? Yes, 85 videos. There they are, Lindsay. Why, why haven't they released any videos showing a big plane going to the site? Because they didn't have any. Actually, they did. The two oh, cameras weren't working that day? What cameras? They have two. They have the parking lot cameras. That's what they have. Are there more? Okay, they didn't release them for security measures or whatever. But so they didn't have pictures. Witnesses don't count. Aircraft debris don't count. None of that counts. Got to see a picture. That's another interesting thing. If you're going to see the picture, there is no way the conspiracy theorist is going to say, well, it was doctored. 
It doesn't matter if there's a picture of it or not. Take a question. What does that mean, Sitco? Uh, that's a gas station. Yeah. Oh. Gasoline station. Oh. Yeah, there was surveillance video at the gasoline station. And Kinko's, okay. The Kinko's was in Florida. Hmm. Florida, where the uh, some of the hijackers went to do things. Oh. This is the list of 85 videos. Okay. So now you know where they went and what they were. So it was not 85 videos of the Pentagon. Okay? Great. Well, I haven't cleared that up. How many of, how many of, the, video, of, of the Pentagon, how many of uh, World Trade Center? Uh, what are you saying? You go on YouTube and see 100? Well, different angles or different views? Sure, yeah. Great. Yep, check right. YouTube. Have a friend help you out. Sure, I'll do it. No problem. 100, yes. Okay, flight 93, where are we at? Uh, this, by the way, this is a uh, website. Oh, by the way, I have DVDs here. I'm selling for $5, which is nothing. But it gives you very good information and some very good videos, which I think is helpful. So if you're interested in seeing the stuff, five bucks for this video. Well worth it, I think. Uh, okay, Pentagon, any questions? No. Yes, sir. Lindsay. Uh, there's, there's reports of people that were working in the Pentagon. Uh, their oral testimony was that they were there when uh, a bomb went off before the, whatever hit the side flew through the hole. Okay. They, uh, what do you make of those reports? They were in the Pentagon. They didn't know what was happening outside. It sounded like a bomb. Most everyone, when that plane impacted, heard what sounded like a bomb. But a plane still went in the Pentagon, didn't it, Lindsay? Have you, uh, well, we don't know that. Don't, we don't know that? We don't know yeah. what okay. the size and shape it was because the videos have never been released. Right, because you need videos because pieces of planes are irrelevant. Okay. That's your way of looking at things. No, but listen. You don't get a chance to do that. No, I do because it's my hour. You don't get a chance to slam. You get your, you get your time no, you, at the you end. You did that four years ago. You don't get a chance uh, to do that. No, I'm afraid of you. All right, All right. All right. Go on. Let's finish your presentation first and go on a question. Okay. So, uh, anything else on the Pentagon? Okay. Great. I'm glad everybody knows that a plane hit the Pentagon. Well, excuse me. You don't know that. Uh, Just keep on talking. Keep on yakking. Keep on talking. You gotta ask all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, flight 93. All right. So, as we know, there's a big crater in a field in the Pen in uh, Pennsylvania. Okay. There's the field crater. Plane impacted uh, greater than 500 miles an hour, virtually straight down. If you don't understand the di well, a lot of people don't. They think they should be seeing more. Okay, this is what it looks like when a plane impacts the ground at a high speed. You can find reports of air of military aircraft going into the ground, and there ain't much left. This one aircraft that went in the ground, uh, military aircraft. The only thing they found of the uh, pilot was a piece of his belly about this big. There's nothing left. This is what you expect to see. However, they did recover a reported 90%, or about 95%, I guess, of the aircraft. And these are pictures of uh, around the crash site. Yes? Maybe UFO involved? UFO involved? UFO. Maybe. I haven't heard that one before, but you know, anything's possible. <laughs> Charlie? I heard these people were this deplaned in Cleveland right. and put in right. the, yes. the government security. They all have new identity. Was it how many? Okay. There was reports of a plane that landed in. I, I think it was Cleveland. Okay. Anyways, it was a misreport. There was a. I believe it was Delta 1989. They thought that was a suspected hijacking, and uh, since it was a suspected hijacking. When it landed, it went over into a secluded area so the FBI and law enforcement can go check it out and make sure it wasn't hijacked and weren't hijacked people. So because of that, people 
made the story, well, it must be people being taken or uh, whatever. They made a conspiracy theory out of that. But that's what happened. Flight 93, anybody? Lenzen! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are you familiar with the videos showing the coroner and other first responders uh, from Shanksville standing around the hole and the videos showing that they can't see any wreckage? Right. No, okay. And then accompanying it, those videos are vid other videos of many different aircraft crafts all over the world inside yes. of Mountain Hill Hole. Yes. And none of them say that the hole swallowed up the airplane. Right. And everything of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Different circumstances. Different circumstances. So this is a one-time thing? You know, no, uh, okay, I'll tell you what. Look up that plane that went into the Alps. Was it last year or this year? A plane just went in the Alps. They said the pilot went rogue and flew the plane inside of a mountain. That was what, this year or last year, right? Yeah. Read the description of that. It says we couldn't find anything. There were small pieces everywhere. That's what aircraft do when they hit the ground at a fast speed. And besides, since this one was almost vertical, it burrowed in the ground anyway. But there's, I don't know, Lindsay, you got pieces of the plane here. You know, I know, but that was planted. True? <laughs> the early, early videos didn't show that. That's all I'm telling you. All right. Okay, anyways. Um, Charles? If it wasn't an airplane, what happened? Did they like come in with bulldozers the night before? Or? Charlie, you're gonna have to ask Lindsay. That's not my <laughs> run. <laughs> I'm only giving the facts. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> ask the UFO. Okay. Good. Good job. Um, what else? Oh, okay. This is an interesting thing. This is another conspiracy theorists are hung up on the goofiest things. Okay. I don't know why, but they are. Uh, much is made out of the coroner. Oh, I'm sorry I speak funny. I've been to England too long. <clears throat> the coroner said that when he arrived at the scene, he stopped being a coroner and he became a funeral director or undertaker because there wasn't any blood and no body parts. Yeah, because there was like hardly anything left. The biggest pieces that he said he found was five sections of a vertebrae. And there wasn't any blood because it was cauterized and obliterated in all over the place. That's what happens to human bodies on a high speed impact into the ground. That's what happens. New York City, this is uh, how the Trade Center was built. As you know, there is the interior core is made up of 47 large columns and around the uh, perimeter there were 59 smaller columns. This here, okay, right here is a uh, model of that's the actual dimensions of a perimeter column. Ann, could you put this on there for me? And what they did around the uh, column is they put on aluminum cladding. Look just like this. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Does it? She's going to say, what's your dime style? No. Okay. So the uh, perimeter columns, they were bolted together. Four or six bolts. How big is the It started out like at uh, half inch, three eighths of an inch three-quarter of an inch at the bottom, and up higher it got to one-fourth of an inch in thickness. It was made out of four pieces of uh, metal, steel, rolled steel, and, and welded together. This is the actual say, uh, scale, this is scaled correctly what it looked like. So then, here you have an access hole which would be here, top and bottom, and they would bolt each section together. That's how it was put together. It's a lot of conspiracy, and then it was topped out with aluminum cladding. It goes the other way. Uh, this is how it was. This uh, wide part was in the interior, and the narrow part here was on the exterior. 
they bolted on the aluminum cladding. In the middle here was a track for the uh, window washing system. Yeah, I love it. A lot of people in the conspiracy theory world, I hope it's reducing more and more as they're getting, being educated, but they make much out of this part here conveniently being cut in pieces that would fit on a flatbed truck to be trucked out. Well, yeah, that's the way it came, and that's the way it went out. These are the sections. This is how it was put together. Uh, where are we at? Okay, so as you can see, here's the different uh, three column sections. The failure point of the building was mostly in the bolts. All these things here, most, a lot of them, came apart where they were bolted to the other one and just fell over. And then this is uh, the dimensions of the perimeter column right here. And then they put insulation over this. And then the uh, aluminum cladding. You see up there those little uh, angle irons up on the top uh, perimeter columns. That's this here. This is almost the same size. Oh, geez, look at that. This is the actual size bolts. They're five eighths inch bolts. And this held the trusses. The trusses were bolted onto this, and this is welded on to the perimeter columns. Okay? By giving it, give it, letting it move like this, this helped re to reduce the swaying motion. Or they put dampers on the bottom part of the truss, which added friction so it wouldn't uh, move about so freely. Okay, next. And this is the trusses. Where am I at? I think you have a question from Carl. Yes, sir. Uh, one quick thing. On those bolts, I know that uh, there's a hardness rating, you know, a certain amount right. of lines on them. Do you know how many hardness ratings were those bolts? I don't. I really don't. But the failure point of the tower when it came down, you'll see on uh, all, most of the pictures, there won't be any bolts left in the perimeter columns. They're just holes. And here, these angle clips, they'll be all sheared off bent off or sheared off, gone. It just couldn't, couldn't keep the weight. So these are the trusses. Uh, that zigzag pattern there, that's made by one inch rods. And that's what supported the floors. Uh, on top of the trusses then, they put sheet metal down and then they poured four inches of concrete. Uh, the trusses then, the core was rectangular. The building was square, the core was rectangular. So there were, excuse me, about 30 feet of distance on the short side, and about 60 feet on the long side. So that's where they put the trusses. And then, the way they insulated the thing, was uh, with spray-on fire retardant, or not retardant, uh, insulation. They sprayed it on. Does anybody believe that fire doesn't melt steel before we go on? Everybody acknowledge fire melts steel? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, if it's hot enough. Some fires. It's got to be hot enough. Yes, very good. Okay, you're with me. Uh, no, I'm not with you. You know, <laughs> it's you don't be, agree? It, I agree. Fire melts steel if it's it doesn't. Hot enough. Yes. Okay, that's all. We I agree. Can. Excellent. No, I'd, like to, I'd like to get your latest take on the theory that molten aluminum from the plane itself was the source of the so-called explosions in there. Because when you melt molten aluminum up to about 500 degrees, 
it turns into a liquid, and then if that liquid integrates with water, you get an explosion. Yes, that's exactly right, yes. Uh, you know, there's a question about uh, additional explosions, really, when you're asking in right. uh, the towers. There are so many things in that place that could explode. You know, computer monitors, uh, molten aluminum hitting water. Uh, there's a lot of sources of explosions, but yes, that's a possibility. And as chaotic as it was, it's probably that happened. Somewhere, okay. aluminum hit the water. Uh, aluminum obviously melts very at a low temperature, comparatively speaking. You can see any house fire, and you see the aluminum doors are melted off, almost always. But so they sprayed on this fire coating. It, it, originally, they put on a half inch. And then some years later, they upped it to about an inch and a half. They started out with an asbestos product, and they went to a certain floor, like 39th floor with asbestos. But then the EPA was starting to clamp down on asbestos, and they went to a non-asbestos product and finished the uh, building that way. Then, when tenants moved out, they went into those floors and put on non-asbestos. But you can see here, on these rods and the, on the truss, that it was haphazardly put on, flaking off. Everything I read and my impression is the spray-on insulation they use was very poorly done and didn't provide a whole lot of protection. Uh, just wanted to show you these pictures of how horrific that impact was. Can you really imagine the damage that was caused inside those buildings? Much more than super, yeah, that was a lot of damage. Tore the guts out of those buildings. Uh, the buildings, they say, and they advertised, could withstand the impact of a 707. Kind of comparable to what uh, impacted them. But they never really took into account the ensuing fires. Seems ridiculous, but that's really true. They did not take into fact in <clears throat> they did not take into consideration the ensuing fires. And the problem here, when you have such a uh, huge fuel-laden impact, is it's causing fires on multiple floors. So even if the fire suppression equipment worked, which it didn't because the plane severed the uh, water lines going up through the core, it would have overwhelmed the system anyway. They wouldn't have had the water pressure to take care of all the multiple fires on the floors. So was a sprinkler building? You know, the, you know, the funny thing is, they didn't put a sprinkler in when they built the place. They didn't put it into like, what, 1996? So anyways, it was later. When finally they said, oh, okay, yeah, now we're... I think it was after the 93 bombing they put in a uh, sprinkler system. But they didn't want to spend the money. So, sir. Well, well, well I heard the architect who designed this building, uh, they were trying to save money, so they used the trust design, and that was a bad design. Uh, it was a good design unless you're going to hit it with a plane and start a big fire. It was but, a bad design because once the one floor melted down, it, it pancaked the Exactly. Yes, down. that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. They had a documentary uh, about this. They, they, yes, exactly right. So the uh, advantage why they use this trust system the more floor space you got, the more money, the more real estate, the more rental property. With the trust design, you eliminated all the uh, additional columns in a traditional steel frame building. This was not a traditional steel framed building. It was known as a tube in a tube design. So they could get all this additional floor space. That's what they did. So uh, flight 11, that hit the North Tower. Flight 175 South Tower. Now here, this is one of these uh, structures, the three column structures, and that's a uh, landing gear of one of the planes which took it out, blew it right off the building. That's what you're looking at. South Tower impacted uh, farther down. It's one reason why it came down faster. South, car, South Tower came down than the North Tower. Also, the way the plane impacted at a different angle, and finally, it was about 100 miles an hour faster 
that additional kinetic energy is, uh, causes tremendous more damage. Cause the big gaping hole. The big gaping hole created what you would see in a blast furnace. Sucked in oxygen, brought it up, fed the fires. Oxygen makes fire hotter, by the way. So there are fires, extensive fires across entire floors. Finally, the uh, south tower came down. And you can see it's tipping over. Some people, I'll answer this as well, some people think, who thinks the thing should have kept tipping over? Nobody? Okay. <coughs> well, it, it couldn't tip over because there's not enough strength to sustain it. It crumbled underneath and came down. It could not take an entire one-fourth or one-third of a building to support that big mass. You'll see people talk about free fall. Okay, it was a lot longer than free fall, which is evident by this picture. You can see that there's uh, pieces of the floor or pieces of the building which are coming down at a level about 40 stories or so below where it's collapsing. So we can easily see, you can see how far down these pieces are compared to where the building's collapsing. So it's a long way from free fall. How, uh, yes, sir? How long did it take for the building to actually, from it started right. falling to the fell? It's hard for me to give an educated guess. I don't remember. So, so there's a lot of evidence, or excuse me, a lot of different answers because it was so clouded in dust we really can't know for sure. But you know, 12, 15 seconds, 10 seconds. Anyway, Lindsen, yes, one more please. And if please finish, bomb, one more please. If there were bombs in the building that it would go down faster or something? I'm not, I don't Well, I'll tell you what, well, I think it was coming down fast. I don't see how you get it any faster. Right. It was coming down. Once a building starts coming down, it's coming down. Lindsen. What do you make of all the hundreds of physicists and chemistry professors, people that work with science, that are reporting that it came down at near free fall speed, like about 10 seconds? Okay, that's, near free fall that's, speed. That's a generic fact that's widely you know, accepted in the scientific community. It's like, except it's accepted in the scientific community. Oh, okay. You know, there's an organization, uh, Richard Gage. He is a member of the Architects, oh, what is it, AIA? AIA. Oh. Uh, well, that's for 9-11 Truth, right? But yeah. there's the, that's, that's Richard Gage's. Uh, right, that's his thing. But there is a um, an architectural group organization, an organization. Yeah. I think it's AIA. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, how many? So you wonder. There's thousands of architects who are members of this organization. Not Richard Gage's organization but the group that Richard Gage belongs to. Richard Gage is the only architect, excuse me, he's the only architect of AIA who doesn't believe the official theory. And you wonder why that is. So there's very few, and you say thousands of architects, engineers, whatever, yeah. Electrical engineers, chemical engineers, software engineers, they're part of this group, so they don't really carry a whole lot of weight. There's about one to two thousand in the Truth Architects group out of sixty to eighty thousand architects. Okay. Anyways, but if it was so obvious, of course, you'd expect that all these people would jump it on and say, "Man, it's obvious," but there ain't. Uh, a lot of people wonder what happened to the black box. What happened to the all the people? You know, there's about uh, eleven hundred victims which are unaccounted for. They have no trace of 1,100 victims. The black boxes, four of them, were never recovered from those two buildings. Where are they at? I think they're there. You're looking at four stories of the World Trade Center. Each story of the World Trade Center, I got you. You can rest your hand. Each, each story of the World Trade Center was 13 feet high. Okay? You're looking at four floors in the space of four feet. When they were doing the assessment, damage assessment, they were in the sub-basement, down the concourse level where all the shops are. 
And so one guy is looking up, and it, it doesn't register. It doesn't make sense to him. He's counting the trusses, which are little wires between the floors. He's counting 10 of them. Excuse me, no, it was 20 of them. He's counting 20 layers of trusses in the space of 10 feet. This thing was impacted so much. Where's the black boxes? They're gone. 1,100 victims, they're gone. Yes, ma'am. So, you, know you know what I heard? I heard, like, those, one of those airplanes, they didn't have windows. Yes, some people said that, but then a lot of people said they did. But maybe it's... A UFO, yes, okay. We're still on there. Another UFO question. Okay, maybe. Uh, <laughs> still there. Did it die? My clicker is not clicking. Battery. Don't click for me, uh, Whitey. Oh. Tim went out for a smoke. Here. You can turn around and sit there or something. Or. Oh. It's working. It's working. It's pushing on it. Oh. I think the mouse got So this is the collapse, the, uh, the north tower. Oh. Second collapse. That little building off to the right hand corner, that's building seven. World Trade Center, World Trade Center, Building 7. And it's a 47-story building, and it was showered with debris. What that did to the uh, Building 7, it took out about 20 stories. It took out a big chunk of the middle of that building. There's not many pictures of it because it's on the inside towards the Trade Center. Most of the pictures you see are on the clear side, the street side. Uh, a lot of people say that, okay, another thing people say is that this, the buildings, all of them, they fell in their own footprint. No, they didn't. The World Trade Center complex was 16 acres large. And those buildings littered that entire area, plus hundreds of feet outside the areas and across the streets. It was littered all over the place. And if it was a controlled demolition, it'd be the sloppiest one ever done. Any questions? Tim. Why did you get so involved with uh, this whole conspiracy theory thing? And what, I mean, why do you do this? Why do I do? Good. Thank you for asking. I'm a person who wants to know answers. I really do. And I don't take people's word for it. I look for the source documents, and not just rumors, and I find out what people actually say, uh, what actually happened. Uh, I believe that I'm very, let's see, I believe in intellectual honesty. Right or wrong opinion, have the opinion you want. I just want you to be intellectually honest. And I feel strongly that this type of talk tears this country apart for no good reason. And I would feel guilty if I let people who are pushing silly conspiracy theories to get away with it. And I didn't say anything. Uh, I, don't, I will never debate this because there isn't any debating. You go through everything, and they say, well, Building 7, well, well, it doesn't matter. 9-11, like global warming, is a religion. Okay? It doesn't have facts to support it. doesn't have evidence. But, but you cannot try and convince people of reality or the truth. So, no, I don't debate at all. I'll tell you the facts. Do what you want with them. Uh, Harris, Harris of Chicago here, Greek hillbilly born in Chicago, 68 years. Now, I want to ask you a question, uh, forgive me if it's personal, but the way, uh, back in my old age after 75, I started asking a speaker, whether in private or in public, uh, to test his uh, credibility. Uh, do you, sir, I just came in late, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, please ask. Do you just have, the question. Uh, just ask. Because to me it means a lot whether you have or do not have 
a military security clearance or a government security clearance? I did when I was in, of course. Okay. Every, pre, almost everybody does have a entry level sec, uh, secret security clearance. I served two years in the army. Yeah. I never had one. Yeah, most now most everybody does, and okay. yeah, That's especially in my job. Okay, I did, yeah. thank you. You're so welcome. Yes, and David Travis. Uh, yeah, uh, my question is, when the first plane flew into the building, why wasn't it like a protocol for a, to immediately dispatch the Air Force to fly around the building? Okay, good, got it. Thanks. Them. Right, good, Air Force. Where's the Air Force? Yes. Why don't they call the Air Force? The Air Force? Um, can anybody name one successful intercept of an aircraft, okay, one. Name one successful intercept of an aircraft by the Air Force. Anybody? Were there any? What day are you talking about? Any. Day? Name a day. <laughs> Give me one. What? Lindsay? Well, when you say well, any there, day. There was a, a case where uh, a, a golfer's plane was off course. Yeah. And then uh, a couple of planes. Payne Stewart? Uh, yeah. Payne Stewart. Where, who, which, which planes were that that went after him? Was that Air Force or? It was Air Force. Civilian? It was Air Force. And they, they intercepted his plane before it crashed. When did they? Do you know when? Okay, you don't. Okay. No, I don't know. The I, didn't, I didn't put you up to this, right? No, I mean, it's, okay. it's not important to know the exact date, right? No, That's not bullshit. the date. The date doesn't matter. No, don't no, care about the date. The date. I'm wondering how long. long. How long? How long? How many minutes? He you was in the minutes for in the air for quite a few minutes. Right, and but okay. They followed him until the plane crashed. Correct. Right. Okay, fine. You're familiar with that. I am. Now, why did you say Air Force never intercepted anything? Successful. What? I guess. What's a successful intercept? <laughs> That would be like a timely manner, not like 12 hours, right? Exactly. Timely intercept. Exactly. A successful intercept, I think, would be considered if it's in a timely manner. That's what I mean. All right. Uh, people think on September 11th that the Air Force should have intercepted the planes at some time, all right? First of all, there were... Catch you in a minute. Is that okay? All right. There were only eight bases which were on alert on September 11th, with a total of 16 planes. It was uh, the end of the Cold War, don't have to worry about the threat, all that stuff. NORAD's job, <clears throat> North Atlantic, no, North American... North American Treaty Organization. No, no, no. Uh, North America Air Defense, NORAD. North American Air Defense Command. Thank you. All right, NORAD, anyways. Their job is to protect the United States from threats outside. That's their job. They're waiting for the Russian bears to hit uh, U.S. airspace. They're going to go uh, track them down, right? So, to answer the question, the first plane, why didn't they send up on the first plane? Because nobody knew or thought it was a hijack. As far as the military was concerned, everybody thought that it was... Geez, the pilot really screwed up, okay? It's only when the second aircraft <coughs> impacted that they knew something's wrong. Now, as to uh, successful intercepts, uh, Payne Stewart, he left Florida. His plane crashed in, uh, I believe, South Dakota. Anyways, so they sent up some Air Force airplanes, and they look in the cockpit, and it's all fogged over. So the pilot's probably incapacitated. Uh, a lot of people hang on to the Payne Stewart thing as, look at this, the Air Force can accept plane, uh, intercept planes quickly. And they look at it and say, look, it only took 22 minutes. Only took 22 minutes. If you don't take into account the time zones. It crossed into Georgia, it was now in central time zone, so it actually took an hour and 22 minutes. So if you consider an hour and 22 minutes as a successful intercept, then that's an opinion. Uh, let's see, Tom Shepard. Yes. Okay, so you you kind of you, you're kind of claiming that it was incompetence. Or, Did I claim? Or, well, when, okay. When, the history of the United States and uh, military <coughs> is incompetence. We are the best country at reacting, but we're not great at taking proactive measures. So we reacted and we did pretty good, but it took a while to spin up. What about the Pentagon one? Don't they? Weren't they protecting the Pentagon? You know why they don't? With what? 
Any ideas? Do I? What do you mean? You said protect. You said don't they protect it? And what? In what way do you mean? Well, a plane flying into it, especially when we've been on alert that. You know, I'm kind of Lisa Rice, of course. Okay. So who would ever suspect right. that they fly a plane into a building? Uh, right. Exactly but, but right. We, we were told that they would. Um, not really. Well, not really. I have the statement. It says that. Uh, it did say that. What it said. He's talking about a, a presidential briefing paper, which said that uh, Bin Laden and associates wanted to hijack some planes. And that could mean anything. And as far as you're saying, why didn't they protect the Pentagon? How many big buildings are there in America? Which buildings do you protect? Well, after the fact, it's easy to say. After the fact, it's easy to say, oh, they should have protected the Pentagon. You're right. They should have. Uh, in any case, why they don't protect the Pentagon. Okay, here's. A lot of people, all this information is in your handout, which I hope you find good reading. A lot of people think that Washington, D.C. has some just great, awesome uh, protection, restricted, the most restricted airspace in America. All right? That's only on paper. All that means is you get a letter from the FAA saying, hey, you violated this, we're going to take your license away. If you remember, Clinton was president. A guy flew a plane on the White House lawn. Just this past year, a guy flew his ultralight on the White House lawn. All right? Pardon? The mailman dude? The mailman dude. Okay. Okay, anyways, so that restricted airspace. How do you do it, right? There will not be missile defense, and there never was at the Pentagon. Why? Because Ronald Reagan National Airport is two miles away. And they're not gonna risk shooting down a civilian aircraft that went off the flight path. The airport's two miles away. I They're not going to shoot down an aircraft or have missiles there. I think it's even closer. <laughs> <laughs> it's right next to Less door. than two miles. <laughs> Can we say that? Yeah, Thanks, Charlie. Very close. Lindsay, please. Can you uh, comment on the, uh, the widespread reports of multiple war games that were running that morning simulating airplanes flying into uh, iconic buildings in America, New York, and Washington? There was war games, I don't believe, and one of the war games that was on the books, on paper, was a scenario of uh, planes being hijacked and going into, I don't, just hijacked, I believe it was. Comment on, I can't confirm that happened the same day. Maybe it did. So you're not, you know, you're telling us you're not familiar with those reports? Uh, I'll that, see if it's happened that day, but uh, then, okay, so it's a co coincidence. Our but military was running multiple war games. They were, yes, they were running multiple that's, war games. That's why our jets were in the air no. and fused and went somewhere else. No, that, no, they that has nothing to do with it. No, that has nothing to do with it. Had nothing to do with it. You, you know, are you asking why the planes went the wrong direction? I'm asking if you're familiar that that's what happened. That's not what happened. Okay. Yes. Did, uh, did people know about 9-11 before it happened? Because I worked at the Federal Center and I worked at the Dunkin' Donuts. There were about 15 Middle Eastern guys there and they were going, hurrah, hurrah, yeah, they were all, and I go there every day for right. decades and, and they, there was something up and we called the FBI about that. You're talking about that was before the event? So two hours before they were celebrating right. and then a lot of people didn't come to work that day. At the uh, Twin Tower. That's not, that's a myth actually. That's actually a myth. It's a myth. Well, I went to work that day. Uh, okay. Sir. Yeah, I think that was in the uh, USA Today. It said that the Jews were told, quiet, the Jews were told to not go to work that day. Now, in, in the World Trade Center. No, wait. So their rabbi, some rabbi called, you know, 5,000 people and told each one, don't go to work that day. Uh, Give me a, a break. break. That's a, yeah, that's I know. It's crazy. Actually, no, you said it was USA Today. You can't, you can't source that. You think, you can't. I heard somebody. Uh, you heard somebody who person. said they heard something. It is not. Yeah. educated person yeah. told me that he read that it. That he read it. it. Today. Yeah. I, I don't I'm believe sure it's in. That no, that's not you. Close that's to that's one moment, please. Please. Or was it? Or was it? Uh, that wasn't in USA Today. I hope not. Uh, it was actually in a Lebanese news, newspaper. And then it was reported other places, uh, but complete myth. Okay, famous I have a final question uh, pertaining to who uh, this.
this uh, September 11 is you got to look at who dies and who does not die uh, with all these terrorist attacks. Now, the owner of the Twin Towers, uh, I forget his name, Silverstein? Or uh, Silverstein. 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 Okay, on Charlie, on Charlie Rose, he said a couple of years ago that he did not go to his office that day right. because his wife reminded him the night before that he had a doctor appointment. Right. Second, I don't ask nationalities, race, or religion. Okay. I ask only a class question. How many corporation presidents or vice presidents died at the Twin Towers on September 11th? I didn't add them up. What? Are there any? Well, you got to understand the uh, head of security of uh, the, both towers, he died. His second day on the job. I don't mean head of security. I mean corporation president, CEO. Oh, uh, I'm sure there were. Chief the the officers. The probably, I'm it's, sure there were. The, well, you, you're I'm an sure expert. You're a most. You no, are I didn't check that. It's, oh, it's yeah. trivia. I, I'm not going to spend my life tracing down every detail. Yeah. It's kind of That's irrelevant. You have to have proof that they were called to notify. Ah, okay. If you look at your folders, who did it? They it's the back uh, part of your folder. You have proof of a call. Hey, Charlie, please. Yeah. Let's uh, <laughs> follow the rules, shall we? And you're too much too experienced to be doing this stuff. Uh, okay, go ahead. Question number six. Do you think that, that Obama, he wants to bring 65,000... Oh, jeez. That's way right outside this. These immigrants, these... Uh, Do you want to bring in more uh, and there's gonna be terrorists jihadists terrorists. into the United States? Right, that's I think it's a good idea, and I don't. Yeah. That's my opinion. Okay, that's what I say. Some people will think... I'm so. going to hold, hold the thought. All right, on the back of your folder, I added uh, something. What you'll see, those strips in there... That's fiber, uh, com carbon fiber composite material. That's what the composite components of aircraft are made out of. That's the actual stuff. Dreamliner. Okay, Dreamliner was made with that. So when you fly a Dreamliner, that's what's protecting you from the outside elements. Uh, a lot of people talk about, a little bit of the Pentagon, that there's no, so the nose of the aircraft are made of that composite fiber, okay? Some people say that there's no way the nose of the plane could have gone into the Pentagon all the way out. Well, yeah, of course not. Now, Donald Rumsfeld, he misspoke and said that the nose of the plane ended up in the sea rate. He was mistaken. He misspoke. He, I'm sure he knows better as old as experienced he was. The way the plane went into the Pentagon, and as all aircraft do when they hit a hard object, the front of the plane is completely ob obliterated. It's gone. Okay? It's everything behind it which is pushing and has to go somewhere and forcing itself in. So, yeah, the nose of the plane has gone. Yes. Uh, hang on. Tim? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll put mine on until the end. It's sort of an irrelevant point. Please, yes. Yes, there, there's a wonderful riddle. What's the last thing that goes through a bug's mind when it hits your windshield? It's asshole. Can we keep that to the end? I don't think that's you know, I part of the That was the whole thing. All right. Are we out of questions? No other questions. I have one. Yeah. Why are you in uniform? Uh, because I want to show that I'm a veteran if anybody thinks I should be arrested. Okay. <laughs> And if somebody wants to call somebody, or if they're going to arrest me themselves, that's, that's the, why. That's the reason? That's the reason. That's the only reason. Yes. I don't believe you. Okay. Okay. If you fought in those undeclared wars, then you're an unindicted war criminal. Okay. You make a citizen arrest. Great. Okay. Are you going to do it or are going to call somebody? Yeah, i got to call my... Call them? Okay, great. I'm not strong enough. I'm leaving in about an hour, so they better get here fast. Uh, <laughs> um, Cubs yeah. or Sox fan? Uh, I'm not big into spectator sports. <laughs> That's a good answer, huh? He's a Bears fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Mr. Anderson. What, uh, you didn't mention at all. Are you familiar with the, uh, the 12,000 pages of uh, oral firefighter history testimony that was released by the New York Times in 2005? No. Well, in a nutshell, that testimony showed 
there were uh, like over a hundred firefighters that were in the area that weren't killed that reported being watching the multiple layers of explosives going off in all three buildings as they were brought down with controlled demolition. Right. Let's yeah, be accurate. Let's move to the Tim, Tim, please. Uh, let's be accurate, uh, Lindsay. What they heard was sounds that sounded like explosions. They heard what sounded like bombs. And your interpretation is that it was. Uh, this whole bomb thing in any of the buildings, if you're going to bomb something with anything, there's going to be something, some residue. There's going to be evidence. You know, pieces of the, uh, the wire, the blasting cap, something. The FBI was there. The New York City Police Department Crime Bureau, ATF. There was no evidence of any explosive device in any of the buildings. There was none. Can you give a reference where somebody found evidence of an explosive device? Not the devices themselves. Well, something had to cause it if it was an explosive, and there was no evidence ever found because there weren't explosives. It's pretty much impossible to be able to get explosives to rig the building. I got a quick comment and then a question. Um, the thing that's so surprising to me is that they can see the wings going through the building. I don't know if there's a lot of photos of that, but it would be really strange for a bomb to look like an airplane going into a building. So it sold you in what direction? What? You said sold you. Oh, I know. Sold you what? That planes went into the building. You know a plane went. Yeah. So I'm fine with that. But my question now is, um, of all these disasters you had up earlier, uh, Lusitania, Pearl Harbor, all these other ones, the, our government knew knew ahead of time that these disasters were going to You say our government. government. That's what? How many President, people? Did he? You say? You say? Did, did they? Okay. No, I'm, I'm asking so. you. Do you think? No, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. No, we're just stupid. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. That's outside the purview of this anyway. Why do you bring it up? The, the, well, you have to understand the federal government is such a huge bureaucracy. Okay, airport security. Why were these hijackers able to take these planes? Is it the president's responsibility? Well, he's got the secretary of uh, transportation. Well, it's not his responsibility. He's got the... Uh, FAA director, not her responsibility. There's a director of each airport, not her responsibility. You've got the head of security at each airport, not that responsibility. You've got the person in charge of the security company, not that person's responsibility. It's the responsibility of the uh, minimum wage employee to check passengers. So, and you got the, uh, the president has the um, national security advisor. Got, so, at what level? The problem is the federal government is so big and unaccountable that it can't do a function all this. You need competent people farther down. Get around these oh, it's the, okay, I'll tell you what. The Israelis, they know how to do security. We're hung up. Do you think a jihadist? Can I just finish my was our government or our president or our I'd say no. I'd say no. Knew about Pearl Harbor. No, no. No, no. No, of course not. Of course not. There's people who probably did, but their warnings were unheeded. Okay. Say it again. People probably like knew, kind of suspected, but they weren't listened to because no one will believe. No one believed. What people were these? Uh, people, analysts, intel analysts. They, Ten offensive. There's people that said uh, in Vietnam, "Hey, there's an attack coming." Oh, there ain't nothing. There's nothing showing up. This is a uh, people didn't believe them or taken seriously. That's the way bureaucracies work. They're mindless bureaucracy. Well, if you're a president or chief That's enough. The had stuff had doesn't come to you. That's your question. Thank you. You would say, you you know, would say it was All right. Yeah, that's enough. Back on topic, please. One time. Back on topic, please. Hey, Doc. Give him an the whole evening. Yes. Why do you have to be so serious? No, you're going on. You're going on. Why do you have to be so serious? All right, now the floor plane that gave us. Yes, ask your question, please, Charlie. Uh, What's waiting? Yes. And waiting. Yes, <laughs> I've seen the Winter Garden is completely destroyed. No, it wasn't. Uh, Had a lot of glass missing, wasn't completely destroyed. So what Sorry. happened to the other buildings, <laughs> four, five, and six? We didn't have the computing ability to do all the buildings, but all the the uh, twin, the World Trade Center complex had seven buildings. 
Then there was the World Financial Complex, which had a bunch of other buildings. The, w, the World Trade Center Complex was those seven buildings. Uh, another thing about aircraft, what people don't realize is the kinetic energy involved in an aluminum aircraft. All right? The commercial airliners have three fuel tanks, underbelly and one on each wing. Okay? Now, as I understand it, most of the airliners, they draw fuel from the center tank before taking it from the wing tanks. So they used up a good portion of the center, but the wing tanks were completely filled. What does that do to a plane when it impacts something? Well, if I throw that at, sorry, I need to hit you. That's not going to do nothing to you. I got a full water bottle. If I knock him on the head. Can I throw it back? Yes, you can't hit me though. Uh, this would hurt. I knew a school bus driver who got knocked out while driving a bus by a soda can. So you got the wings filled up with this. That much mass is going to do something. Um, let's go. Uh, they were continental flights. They were all paid with Right. Well, there's, they say there's about 10,000 gallons left. Okay. All right. This is steel. This is a piece of steel. These little pieces of lead put holes in this piece of steel. How is that possible? How can those little pieces of lead go through steel? And you have any question about how a 200,000 pound aircraft can go through a thin building? You got to be kidding. It's dynamics. Okay, one other demonstration. I don't want to uh, not use these. Oh, I got a question. Good. Yeah. Okay. We've we got to start rebuttals here soon. Why, why is everyone thinking about the trade center? What's your opinion? There's some people who wonder why the uh, towers came down so fast and why there wasn't enough resistance. Why didn't the rest of the building hold up that little part on top? I'll show you. Static. I just took off one third of the weight. That's ten pounds. I could. That will be there tomorrow. It crushed them before. Dynamic. That's why the towers fell the way they did. Once they came down, hundreds of thousands of tons not pounds, but hundreds of thousands of tons started coming. There wasn't nothing that's going to stop them. They're coming down. Why are they always going after World Trade Center? Why don't they go after that? Because that's, somewhere else. That's the, that's the uh, symbol of America and their financial strength. America's a capitalist country. All this money, okay. you go after the money. That's a symbol. Also, they were big. You have to understand they were big. Quick. Uh, they always go after a question, but to, to help your demonstration, the, the floors were four inches thick, and if you, if you could measure the 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 width of the floor, or whatever. About an acre. Each okay. floor was about an acre. Okay, and then add that for every floor that was above the impact zone, that's, that adds to your... Oh, and that's another thing, right? It's not just the floors, which is all that weight. Each time it comes down, you're adding another floor of weight. So the speed actually accelerated as it came down. You're adding more and more and more mass, mass. The physics is all about speed and mass. Going through buildings or falling down. Speed and mass. Okay. Good. Let's get into rebuttals. Oh, go ahead, man. Thank you. Let's hear it for our speaker. some comment to make to the rest of us, and uh, Ron, you just came in, but uh, you, you certainly have a comment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go about four and minutes, Brom. Of course, uh, nine. All right. Go about four uh, minutes. Right, about how good. much time does that give? Ah. Go about four minutes. Strictly enforced. Four minutes. Okay. Please line up here. We have uh, 
three uh, seats here, and I'm going to sit over where I've been sitting. Of course you can. All right. Uh, Carl Schwett will have our first, first uh, rebuttal. Oh, All right, you guys can see the timer. When you're ready, we'll start. Today's your lucky day. Haven't already paid their Okay. Ready? By the way, you guys are going to be happy tonight. I got no statement to make. Good. Sit down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's give our attention. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'm, I'm ready to, to say this. Um, I, I've been actually a kind of a follower of Andy Anderson. I really enjoy a lot of what Andy uh, brings to the college. But this is the one real thing that I really disagree with Andy on. And I, I want to thank this uh, speaker, you know, for facing this crowd, you know, and uh, giving this presentation. Um, I also feel I'm kind of like uniquely qualified to answer or to add to some of this. Um, those of you that know me, I work for Honeywell, I work on commercial heating and air conditioning, I work on large buildings downtown. And on the day in question, I was on a, a book. Oh, hey, what do you would you please pipe down over there? Hey, what do you mean? One fall at a time. So this is funny. This is the guy that's always bitching when somebody is talking when he's talking, and now he's talking. Riser race. Riser race. Okay. So I've been on the roof of a 28-story building and at the time that this happened, and I can tell you that I knew something was up because you can normally see the plane circle around and go and land at midway. Then all of a sudden, it was like all the planes just lined up everywhere, boom, 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 boom. One plane after another landed, not one plane took off. Um, maybe one of the other things that might not have been covered today was uh, in this concrete work. Uh, there's, he said, like four inches thick. Uh, I've drilled through floors like that. Uh, they're, they're not that structurally strong to start with. Uh, and, and then when you get to start talking about elevator banks, you know, there's openings in there, there's duct work, uh, there's all kinds of wiring, there's all kinds of plumbing. Uh, another thing that I've noticed from working in a lot of these complexes downtown, there's literally hundreds of people that work behind the scenes in a lot of these buildings. I've run into guys that work under the building engineers that do nothing but change light bulbs all day. And there, there's guys that have little carts with like different samples of paint on and they go around the building and touch up little marks you know, here and there. These are all people that have very intimate knowledge of buildings. It would almost be impossible to get by all these different people and, and plant bombs or put something behind the wall or, you know, whatever, you know, possibility. Um, let's see, I know I wrote down a couple other things here, but I think I covered most of what I wanted to say. And I wanted to, again, I want to thank you, Speaker, for coming out tonight. Thank you. <laughs> well, there's. Uh, I don't really uh, believe it was a conspiracy, but there were certain things that were happening, like in Germany, uh, these people uh, were getting together and they knew something was going on, was being planned by these people that carried out this uh, disaster. And then there's a time when they you know, took up flying and they were very suspicious. They didn't want to learn how to land, how to land the plane. So I think what really happened was um, we were in the Cold War for, from 1945 um, until uh, 1991, which is a very long time. And in this process of being in a Cold War, the corporations were making fabulous profits of building the war machine. The profits are just tr tremendous. Right now, the United States uh, constructs 41% of all armaments in the world. 
So there's a tremendous amount of profits in that. Another thing too, the United States has been an imperial power since the Spanish-American War in 1898. And it's, it's always right had a war to fight, just about. And this is the only thing that brought us out of the real, the, the Great Depression of 1929. Uh, Dean Acheson, at one point, right after the war, right before the war ended, that is, made a statement that we have to have a way to keep the war machine going. Because if we stop the war machine, the whole economy will go. And why is that? Well, the United States produces so many products, and it doesn't pay the workers that much to buy it back, and it has to have uh, raw materials, it has to have markets, it has to have a lot of things, and the only way we could get that and make the huge profits is by a war machine. So when the Cold War ended in 1991, they were looking for enemies. And they didn't have no enemies for a very long period of time. So anything that happened, like for instance uh, the, uh, uh, the buildings uh, being uh, destroyed, the trade centers being destroyed, was the rationale for a new Cold War. And that's what we have, the war on terror. Of course, they could have went along and looked for these terrorists in a different way, sending, uh, let's say, police into those areas to try to capture these people. But uh, they, want, they wanted to keep up with the armaments race, so what happened was they had to have a rationale, and this was the rationale for the whole thing to take place. And we're still fighting those wars in the Middle East. We never stop. One war uh, generates another war, and then another war, and then another war. It's an endless war. The United States be, has become a war economy built on war, on a war machine. And they had to have rationales to keep it going. I think that this is the real reason why we have these problems. Thank you. Uh, All right. Thank, yeah, thanks, Bill, for uh, attempting to defend the official story. But I think it's indefensible. So I'll address a few points <clears throat> that you brought up. Um, you said that the plane went through three rings of the Pentagon. That would have been the equivalent of uh, nine feet of, uh, because there were walls between, uh, between the rings. That would have been the equivalent of about nine feet of concrete reinforced, uh, steel reinforced rings. Uh, no plane is gonna go through nine feet, a nine foot wall. It was essentially a nine foot wall. That's just the plain reality. You said that the outer columns uh, went from three eighths inches at the bottom to one quarter, three eighths of an inch at the bottom to a quarter of an inch. That's way off. Uh, there were several inches at the bottom, and they went to a bare minimum of one quarter at the very top. Where the planes impacted, they were more than a quarter, up to a, uh, at least a half an inch at, at, at the impact points. That is thick steel, and aluminum, thin aluminum, especially the wings, are not going to go through that kind of steel, period. Uh, and that's the physical reality. Also, you, you bought the trust and presented the trust theory of, of the uh, construction of the World Trade Center Towers. They were actually steel, hello, am I, is somebody else speaking? Um, okay, there were um, actually I-beams in the floors. And, and uh, I presented photographs of those I-beams at my last 9-11 uh, uh, presentation. So that was a part of the big cover-up. Those floors were much stronger than the official story. Much, much stronger. You said the planes um, tore the guts out of the building when they impacted. Well, first of all, there were no planes, but assuming for the sake of argument that there were planes, they would have only, quote unquote, torn the guts out of a small portion at the top. The rest of the buildings are perfectly intact. So there's no force, physically speaking, Plain physics, simple physics, there's no force to uh, come down uh, on the rest of, to, to smash down the rest of the building, which is still perfectly intact, uh, strong steel. That's physically impossible. Um, the landing gears can go through um, a lot, uh, through strong structures. The wings 
uh, are very weak and thin, and they're not going to go through uh, steel, uh, through, through thick steel. Uh, and the, the fuel inside the wings doesn't have any tensile strength, so that, so that doesn't add uh, much of anything. Um, you said that the, plane, the, the building came down, uh, we said that the planes came down at a lot longer, in a, in a lot longer time than free fall speed. They were, it was roughly free fall speed. Uh, there's a lot of talking going on. Uh, thanks. Okay. Um, the building came down at roughly free fall, free fall speed, and that's physically impossible because, there, again, there was no force to bring, bring them down. Uh, let's see, I could, I mean, there are a lot of things here. Um, okay, um, this steel, uh, I, I'll, I'll take the word that it's steel, okay, but it's only like a, a millimeter and a half, okay. That doesn't prove anything. Uh, the steel that we're talking about with the World Trade Center Towers, if I may, uh, yes, your prop here. Or right, whatever. This steel, uh, I wouldn't have been able to pick this up uh, like this if this was actually steel. I could if it was aluminum. There's a, there's a photograph of um, the uh, workers uh, are carrying uh, the aluminum piece of a plane, uh, of the wings of that plane that fell, that came down in uh, Indonesia or, or in the Indian Ocean. You know, the, the plane that was supposedly lost. Well, recently, uh, part of it was found, and it's been proven that that was part of the plane that, um, okay. supposed, that was lost. Um, <clears throat> that piece of the plane, is like twice the size of this thing right here, but it's aluminum, and these guys were carrying it like like nothing. Okay, okay. they wouldn't have been able to carry that uh, if it was steel. One one last, really quick. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Um, this here. Okay, when you smash this down, okay, you smash this down steel onto a plastic cup. Of course, it's going to smash that thing. It's not going to smash more material identical to this. Thanks. Time. It's only eight or nine. Let's go. Why don't you give people five minutes, right? Yeah, let's go. Yeah. 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 Our work on the permits run eight or nine. I was wrong. I forgot my time. Five minutes. It don't work. I didn't catch the. Um, I didn't catch the presentation. I have gotten these presentations from both sides. I've seen all the films on the various questions of the physics. What I'd like to address tonight is what is blatantly there before us all and never discussed, which is part of the diversion, and that's 28 pages in the permanent record of the 9-11 report that point to who financed it. And there are 80,000 pages of documentation now in the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation, which they were forced to release. You have situations in New Jersey, you have situations in California. What I'm getting to is this 28 page is not something in and of itself, it's actually more of other uh, information that the Saudi Arabians, down to check stubs that have been traced, this British operation that hit this as part of a kind of colored revolution on the United States to actually foster these wars, like some people have been saying, and those go on today still because this has not been dealt with. There was no investigation on this, these networks are still in place, in fact, the present president of the United States, with Brennan and these characters, are still running this operation, supporting Al-Qaeda, supporting uh, El Nusra, and even arming and training what's supposed to be going up against uh, ISIS, which is a disaster. They get captured as fast as we uh, turn them over because people are actually turning intelligence on them, like the Turks. So you have a free-for-all going on. Uh, like before World War I, which is precisely the project and the policy, get a back down. Now something happened in the last couple of days that's playing a major role in not only getting the 28 pages open up and also stopping this ISIS operation, and that's the international coalition that's coming together with Putin's intervention now in Syria that happened last week where they're on the ground in Syria, moving against ISIS, supporting uh, Assad and Syria, not to be toppled like the nation under uh, the British-run Obama and Bush moved on Libya and others. So as they move to now knock out ISIS and lay the basis for development, the whole program for the BRICS, American system of direction, of credit as LaRouche has been laying out, is now in a position to build the other direction. Now that's coming to a head here on the 28th, when the entire world comes to the United Nations. And that's 
an economic policy, it's the policy against terrorism, it's the policy against this war. And what we have to deal with right now, and I'm not saying this lightly, is the very same Obama that has covered up, after promising two times to release these 28 pages, covering up still, this Obama who's still working with the Al-Qaeda and whatever, he has got to be lifted off these buttons with, with the, um, the 25th Amendment, which says you remove a president and a policy that uh, is out of control. And that can be done overnight, and we can shift the whole thing. But to continue to talk and talk and talk about the logistics of this, it's the diversion they want. Some of it you'll know, some of it you'll never know. The problem is, who did it and why? And if you want something really incredible, go back and pull back the Jack Stockwell show, September the 11th, 2001, 7 o'clock in the morning, a fellow named Lyndon LaRouche was on the air in Utah live as the buildings were being hit. That's how he found out, on live, running for president at the time. And he detailed that we should think about this in light of a Reichstag fire creating the situation for a lockdown. And we've been living in that ever since. And what I'm trying to get across here tonight is you can dig through all these kinds of particulars but finally have the courage to look at who's running the operation against the United States, what are we doing about this financial blowout that's now hitting two quadrillion in derivative debt blowing, and are we going to put that through a bankruptcy and build out of this like the United States used to do? That's on the line today. Those 28 pages have got to come public in this impeachment or the removal of Obama through this 25th Amendment. So. Thank you. All right. Neil Rent. Hi guys. Uh, I, I had wanted to ask uh, Andy a couple of, of detailed questions, but a few other things have uh, pushed themselves up onto the top of my list. And the most important neglected thing about 9-11 is that it was a great success. Osama bin Laden's stated objectives were to get American troops out of Saudi Arabia and to cause American democracy to implode and destroy itself. He won. It worked. Many of us know the folklore that a tornado can drive a broom straw through a, a two by four or a roof shingle or whatnot. That's an example of what high school physics calls kinetic energy. An umpty-ton plane at 500 miles an hour has a metric buttload of kinetic energy. The fact that it crumples itself into little bits of aluminum foil on the way through is a small expenditure of that energy. It just keeps going. Uh, if you pass high school physics, you should know that. Uh, oh, incidentally, Linda LaRouche is probably the most creative dishonest nutcase in American fringe oh, politics. Okay. And that's a highly contested position. Um, I've been aware of him for decades. He's a, a whacked out uh, publicity hound. And when you run into his acolytes and you say that you've heard of this publicity hound, you're immediately suspect and they try to drive you away. Um, I have several entertaining stories, but not enough time for it. Um, a couple of people have talked about, quote, the government, unquote. There's no such thing. There is an enormous collection, a miscellany, of bureaucracies, agencies, and, and people just trying to keep their jobs. Um, it is not in any organized fashion any single thing. Um, if you've ever been to a government office and been referred to another government office, you, you probably get the idea. Uh, Andy, as I understand it, you believe that 9-11 was controlled uh, demolition, like with explosives. Um, is, is that correct? Yes. Okay. What is the largest controlled demolition on, on official record? What's the biggest building that's been taken down? Yeah, I think the tallest were the Twin Towers. I'm not sure. I said on the record, officially, you know, that, 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 that the people in the industry talk the about. Seattle Kingdom. Pardon? The Seattle Kingdom. Okay. Um, 
that's a completely different shape structure in in terms of Las, like big Las office Vegas, building Las tower uh, uh, what what's the biggest demolition they talk about the Sahara or the, the, maybe the, the sands or something in Vegas R roughly how big I said I forget the name but it's large building, not nearly as large as the ones on the That's the ratio I'm talking yeah. about. It's a, a, a fraction of the size. Yeah. How much explosives did that take? That's where it's not Okay. What multiple of that much explosive would have been required to take down the World Trade Center? A large multiple. Like Truck loads. ten times more than ever used before? Oh, no. Are you going to give us the answer? You, you're the people that claim that you've got answers. I'm, I'm trying to find out what answers you think you we have. have. We have technicians. The buildings were brought down by controlled demolition and maybe some other exotic uh, 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 processes. That's so, so, so the UFOs were running I a controlled no, demolition. No, no. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Just, just some, some unknown fancy, fancy ma magical process. You know, are you familiar with Judy Wood? You're not apparently. With who? Judy Wood. No, I'm not. Judith Miller. Judith Miller, yes. Judy Wood, no. You don't know much about 9 11. So you don't know how many tons of explosive it would have taken. You don't know how many people it would have taken to plant the explosives. You don't know how much pre-planning and surveying that would have taken. You you don't you know don't know I'm how much engineer. lead time well, the project would have required. I'm not an engineer. You can ask engineers and they'll give you those answers. Reputable engineers? Yes. Many. Again, you don't know the literature. You don't know this subject very well, apparently. There are tons of engineers. But I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I live in reality. I am a science oh, so, fiction so, so fan, but, but that's not so you live in reality, where so I live. Uh, all right. Thank you. No more dialogue. There is one thing. No thorium. Despite, no, not thorium. They got my cat. I could bring that up in some other way, but there is one thing that we're all kind of forgetting here tonight. Yes, we've had a good and great debate on the buildings, the causes, the conspiracy theories, and that's what free speech is about. But there was a lot of people whose lives were lost on that day, and I'd like to just bring a brief moment of silence so that we can acknowledge those who did lose loved ones and to our armed forces who are or did in the succeeding wars. I'd just like to get a brief moment of silence for everybody involved. And with that, I'd like to put a round of applause for anybody who may be in the armed forces or may have had any loss on 9-11, just to acknowledge that, you know, we do and we are a caring people. Thank you. All right. You know, I uh, I have a challenge for both these guys. The officer here and Andy. I kind of agree with both you guys a little bit. Um, I really didn't think there was much of a conspiracy. And then on PBS, late one night, I watched Putin's Way, uh, the president of uh, Russia. And uh, this was 1999 when he became president. And as it turns out, long story short, he bombed some civilian apartment buildings. He killed like four or 500 people. Uh, nobody knew that he did it, or Yeltsin did it, and it was in 1999, and uh, they started a war after that. It was called the Chechen War, and so that gave them reason to bomb the heck out of Chechnya. So, as it turns out, excuse me, no Gizlund, no UFO stories. 1999, Putin became president because the elections were delayed because of this new, new Chechen, Chechen war and the bombing of these apartment buildings in, in Moscow, in Russia. Susan. Thank you. 
Uh, they called something called jingoism. Jingoism is when the population remember us all in 2003. We couldn't wait to go to war. Everybody was flying their flags. Oh my God! There's yellow cake uranium flowing into Saddam's bedroom. He's gonna make a nuke, and we're all supposed to be scared. That was 10 years ago. Remember all that, folks? So anyway. Putin becomes president because he starts a war and jingo, jingoism happens in Russia. So everybody's behind a war. So let's bomb the crap out of kids and old people in Chechnya. Okay, so that's 1999. I've said that a couple times. George Bush meets with Putin June 16th of 2001. George Bush meets with Vladimir Putin. June 16, 2001. 9-11 happens. 9-11-2001. Oh. Shh. No more UFO stories. <laughs> All right. Bush again meets with Putin. 2002. November 22nd. Why is George Bush, Bush such good friends with Vladimir Putin? This guy is a real bad guy, this Putin. I encourage everybody to watch Putin's way, and if you don't think governments, I don't believe that bombs blew up World Trade Center, those wings going into the building kind of sold me on, on the fact that they were planes. But as far as a conspiracy, let's face it, you could hire 20 guys to take over a couple planes, and get around the security detail, the different levels, and it was much more lax in 2000 and 2001 than it is today. And I think you could possibly think, no, that, okay, we'll knock down a couple buildings in America, and then we could start a nice big Cheney, Halliburton oil, oil war that'll go on for decades. And guess what? We have a nice big long oil Cheney Halliburton war that's been going on in the second decade. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Andy, make the connection between Cheney. Hello, I'm Gary Gehagen, invited by Timmy. I'm really, I really like this group and the way you guys are organized. Uh, I we were flat. My wife and I we just flew in from New York. I work near the. I worked and I still work near where the towers came down. When I heard the the hit, I was outside watching the first tower burn. When the second one, I thought it was a bomb because I was on the wrong side, so I didn't see the plane coming in. And I was still watching when the tower came down. The interesting thing. I have two interesting things to tell you. I'm not debating the conspiracy theory. I missed. I believe it wasn't a conspiracy, but that's secondary. The interesting thing was when the, when the dust cloud came, it was so dark in there. I, you know, I thought that it was smoke, and I thought I wouldn't be able to breathe. And it was something that I haven't seen in the reports, that there was no light. And it wasn't because the dust was thick. It's because it was so high up that the light was not getting down to the street level. It was really interesting to first be escaping from the, the debris, the light debris that was dropping around. I thought it, there might be heavy debris coming, so I climbed under a car, and I thought, I, I won't be able to breathe it soon if I can't even see anything, no sunlight. And it was just feeling my way through. But uh, So I eventually found my way into a building and cleaned out my eyes and my clothes and threw everything away I could. By the time I came out of that building, the other tower had come down. That's one thing I just wanted to t tell you for the fun of it. And the second one is, I have a friend who worked for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers on 34th and Park Avenue. I'm a mechanical engineer too, and I've read the reports, and it's very convincing about the towers coming down. But the, she works for them as a publicist. She's not an engineer. But she said she and all the engineers were looking out at the fire because they had a good view of the towers burning, and they said, fire that hot is going to melt the steel. That's what they said to her. She didn't know, and that's what she relayed to me. And I don't know that that kind, I don't, I'm a kind of New York liberal and read the New York Times, and that's my main source. They extracted from the 500-page report, but they, I didn't read the whole thing. 
but I don't, so I'm not sure if that part, those aspects came into it. But that's all I wanted to tell you. Thanks for letting us through. If you want anybody wants to reference that biography of Putin's wife, you can see it up there online. That's where Katie got his idea. And uh, you can also, uh, I'll show another web reference later on. You're not interested in that. It has nothing to do with this. Thank you. Thank you. Putin have to do with anything. Because he pulled it off in Russia was, two years earlier. Oh, get out of here. I okay. just told you, Putin Stupid. Put more buddy. Who's next? You're next. Right. You're next. That's right. So now we're blaming Putin. Well, now we've got a new theory. No, no, this is ridiculous. Yes, it is. Oh, the Russians did it. watch that documentary. All right, Ted. Have you got to this first his new theory. The Russians did this. No. The communists did it. No, he copied what Putin did in Russia. No. Anyhow, I want to apologize to Ron here. Uh, I have some respect from all points of view concerning this matter. We've had the 9-11 truth people uh, down here from Madison at the very beginning of this uh, topical debate, so to speak. Uh, and we've handled it over time, different things. I was going to comment here on intelligence. I kind of spend a lot of time reading military history, and the, if they use the term intel, uh, yes, you try to ascertain what your opponent, the opposing forces are going to do. <laughs> it's not always accurate, and you gave a few examples here. I could think of about 500 examples from military history where they were sure or uncertain and things like this. Uh, a classic example is despite all the efforts of the German military, they were able to ascertain precisely when D-Day was going to take place. And they were deceived even after it started. To show you that this is not a precise science, um, actually, the thing about World War II is, amazingly enough, the Russians, and I don't know particularly why, were able to tell everything that the Germans were going to do in advance. Even on occasion, they would attack them. They knew the Germans were, let's say, going to attack on Monday morning at 10 o'clock, and the Russians would attack at 9 just to disrupt them. They were amazingly good at this, at that. But as to the Russians having 9-11, I don't know where that's at in the literature. Now, I've been a couple of things. Now my turn, thank you. Um, you mentioned this Judy Wood, and it hasn't been discussed tonight, except in part passing, that she came up with this theory that there's all kinds of things about dustification. And we were talking about building demolition here, that this was some sort of a unique situation in the demolition of buildings. Unfortunately, again, in studying military history, there were reports of dustification all throughout Europe in World War II using conventional bombing. This is what happens. And there are reports, many, I've come across one where they said, just like the World Trade Center, buildings went down and the German mentioned that there was not one piece of that building that was larger than a fist. So this is not a unique situation. She wrote this book claiming that there was some unique aspect that went on here and I can't give it any validity. The other thing, um, they have no control over this. Understandably, you have many voices who come forward. <laughs> and I don't expect the 9-11 truth crowd to have to defend all of them because there's no formal uh, structure to this. Now, there is this blonde woman, what's her name? That Sharon or something? She's... You, some of these people are tough. They're a discredit 
to what you're trying to do. She's not well. I think she spent some time in a mental institution. And then she comes forth as a spokesman for the 9-11 truthers. And you can't control it. But she does bring discredit upon, upon what's going in. I spent a lot more time than I should have on this topic <laughs> for some reason. Um, if you go to the internet and you type in debunk and go to the videos, you can spend hours and hours. Um, in final analysis, I think all of you are familiar with Oakham's razor or Oakham's rule that the simplest explanation is probably the most accurate one. Um, you come up with theories, and I think you ran into some of the things he was pointing out. This guy here, if it if it was explosive, what kind of explosive? Who put the, you know, you're, you're creating a, a network here, and it gets too complex, and that's the problem you'll run into. Uh, people like Judy Wood, I don't give any credibility whatsoever. She She's got the wrong approach to, it's induct, she came up, you induct it as you, you, you go out and you get evidence and then you arrive at a conclusion. She started with a, very often they start with a conclusion here, you've got to be careful that in the whole 9-11 truther is deductive, is that it was not the way it was explained and therefore your approach is not inductive, it's deductive. And that's what religion does. Okay. You know. Hi, Anyhow, Charlie. thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Bill. You come a bit of a voice. You spent a lot of time in up here. And I don't think you've convinced anyone, but who knows? <laughs> Where's that good display here? Look at look how it happened. There, that group right there. Right? If Charlie can go six and a half minutes, we'll let Andy go. Oh, six and a half six minutes. And a half? Yep. Oh my God! We'll let Andy go six and a half minutes. <laughs> my time. I get, Andy, you can see mine clear. Okay. Yeah. All right. See the screen. Oh, this you, you also got it right here, Andy. You got it right there. Okay. And then you can take a look at the screen here. When you're ready, Mark, and we'll start. Go ahead. Okay. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank our speaker for the effort and time he's put in to try to maintain what Ted says it is defending the indefensible. Um, the answers, there's a worldwide, okay. let me try to keep my train of thought uh, steady because there's, we went all over the room so many straw men, red herrings. Uh, if you don't know the answer to a fact, oh, UFOs must have done it. Or, you know, there was all kinds of verbal denigration and bullying of people going on here at night. And that, that shouldn't really happen in a free speech forum. There's, a, there's something, a good friend of mine a year ago, uh, I, I followed their uh, daughter's career as a runner for 20 years. I was good friends with the family. And I haven't talked to him here. I said, you know, what are you guys doing? And I told him what we were studying. She says, oh, I can't go there. In America, there are people, uh, a chunk of the population uh, are in the same boat as um, what Jack Nicholson talked about in A Few Good Men. He says, you can't handle the truth. You don't want, you know, pe people, if they were wearing little rose-colored glasses with little springs on you just see the glasses flop down over their eyes at the first instant of any kind of information coming in that they can't handle. There's all kinds of studies now showing that a segment, maybe 20% of the population in America is flat out immune to facts. 25% of our current high school biology teachers believe that humans were riding young dinosaurs as ponies 6,000 years ago. Totally out of touch with reality, and you have to go, you have to get a college degree to be a high school biology teacher. There's a war on science in America. People are taught 
not to follow uh, what we teach seventh graders. We teach seventh graders in science in order to find, solve any problem, you must first correctly identify the problem. And then you have to correctly identify the solution. Sheila Samples uh, was a writer out of Oklahoma City, a military public relations uh, writer, and she wrote a bunch of articles. Finally, after about three or four years, she wrote an article, uh, I think it was titled, uh, you know, Eliminating the Impossible. She said, I never thought I would bring myself to say this, but I gotta say it. Anybody with half a brain and one eye can see that 9-11 was a total inside job. The evidence is so overwhelming that Professor Griffin said, you don't even need an open mind to understand this. You need a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education to be able to understand the facts and the forensic evidence that are uh, what one man wrote a book called Transparent Conspiracy. They said a transparent conspiracy is one that the official report they put out is so transparently false that when you start to investigate it, the, the message of the people that did the, uh, the damage, they're saying, uh, we want you to know that we did it, and this is the false idea we're putting out. And 9-11 was a transparent conspiracy, and also one of the greatest false flag operations this country's ever seen. And uh, there's articles, I mentioned a, a new video that came out two days ago. So I, I don't inspect our speaker or anybody else here have, have had time to watch it. It's called Decade of Deception, the full film. It's new for 2015 and it was released on September 10th. It's, the write-up is in this flyer I made. Uh, there's 30 of them, so anybody wants one. Uh, the other article on here is titled, Can Americans Escape the Deception? 9-11 was the greatest deception that this country has ever been subjected to. Make a few simple observations here. Our speaker was not familiar with the eyewitness testimony of the firefighters, more than 100 of them, that reported witnessing the layers of explosives that went off from the top down in both towers. The two twin towers did not collapse to the ground. They rolled over Manhattan as a cloud of dust, went sideways in the wind. That's a published fact. That's not any kind of conspiracy theory. Our speaker was not familiar with the multiple war games that were running on the morning of 9-11, vigilant warrior, vigilant guardian, simulating the exact same thing that was happening in real time so that people that were looking at their computer screens said, is this one part of the war games or is this real time? Many people in the room are not familiar with a group called Pilots for 9-11 Truth. Military pilots, top gun pilots, log on to their site or send away for their DVDs. Um, and many military people, active and retired, are part of that Pilots for 9-11 Truth group. Uh, the reporters, reporters on the day of 9-11 were using the term controlled demolition. They knew what they were looking at. Is that there's multiple reports, videos that went viral all over the world with reporters out there that day saying, didn't that look like a controlled demolition of old, like old hotel buildings? And I'm a Vietnam veteran. I sympathize with your service. I feel as veterans, it does not give us the right to denigrate the efforts of other veterans, like the Veterans for 9-11 Truth, that are trying to help take back our country from the criminals that are running it right now. We are in our 15th year of Bush-Cheney crimes. Smedley Butler wrote a book called War is a Racket, published in 1935. Maybe one final thought. Uh, he said war exists mainly for big billionaires to make enormous profits in wartime that they can't make in peacetime. So um, there's I, uh, one final thing, uh, this is a back of the envelope thing, I made this this afternoon. So what, what can you tell people succinctly in 30 seconds? I, I wrote these four sentences and copied it. There's, anybody can have one. Number one, there's no statute of limitations on murder. However long it takes for the investigation, you can bring the criminals to justice. 3,000 people and millions of others, casualties around the world, were murdered by the people that created 9-11 and the aftermath of our going into foreign countries. The 9-11 Toronto report spells out the whole history 
of that and that new video, that two hour video. If you don't have time to read 100 books on this, log on and watch that video. This book I mentioned earlier, 9-11, okay. is 19 people. The 19 pictures of hijackers, many were even on the planes. It gives you a, a, a nice example of uh, the 19 people that were in key positions to orchestrate it, okay? So, and, and, and Charlie, your question, you keep denigrating Professor Judy Wood's book. Yeah. Well, she's, what, what she's okay. saying, you missed the point totally. You all missed the point. What she said is, you look at the forensic physical evidence. You study the evidence and work back okay. from there to see what happened. You start with the evidence first. The number one okay. fact is the Twin Towers went sideways in the wind, spread over lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. They were dustified in seconds. That's a, it's only done with high energy explosives. There was no collapse of the so Twin Towers. So those hours. reports of okay. the were wrong? All right, let's see. Uh, the reports were wrong from the media. All right. She said it was Star Wars beam weapons. No, yeah. no, she didn't those say Those are the first yeah, words on her web page. She did not say that. Directed energy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Our that's speaker different. gets the final Don't talk word. about UFOs and everything else. Study the evidence. That's she all she says. She says there was a machine. Come on, Andy. All right. Five minutes from. I'm from the Spurt, and I will try to be brief. The uh, fact is that the World Trade Towers, uh, very prestigious uh, monument, uh, iconic, were blown up. They were had been for some years a uh, target uh, of uh, people uh, people like Osama bin Laden and uh, the Al Qaeda people. Uh, the United States is not admired by all people in the world, particularly in the Middle East. The Middle East is ruled by dictators and uh, by, uh, used to be ruled by a Shah in Iran, uh, the uh, Sabak uh, were his uh, uh, police, uh, they were uh, practically a Gestapo uh, and uh, uh, those who have replaced them with another regime. Uh, are not always too kindly either. Uh, so, uh, the people in the Middle East have a rather oppressive, uh, self-elected uh, regimes, uh, and they uh, and they also very much resent uh, the state of Israel. Uh, whether they're uh, of one denomination or another, because they're intruders, uh, settlers, uh, colonists uh, taking over, and you know, and the uh, supporters of uh, Israel in the United States have been uh, very sensitive uh, to uh, admitting uh, people from that region. Uh, to the United States because the state of Israel is dependent on the United States militarily and financially and diplomatically. Uh, so we, uh, we have a situation in which uh, the whole subject of 9-11 uh, is uh, a uh, a, a cause celebre, it was the, the excuse uh, for invading Afghanistan and uh, then later Iraq because those people are unreliable at least. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to realize that whether there be uh, Debunkers or the 
the people uh, who uh, okay. use the event uh, for one one rationale for for one set of actions or another. There's, there's still the question of what, how do you treat people? How do you treat people who are in the Middle East or fleeing from the oppressions of the Middle East? Okay, Brahm. That's the question that we will have before us for years to come. All right. Okay. Very briefly, we got. Okay. Very, very brief. Go ahead. Very brief, and then our speaker go. Our a, a a very quick postscript. Several times in the last few days, I have seen repetitions of a very important misunderstanding of the event of 9/11. Nearly four, th uh, sorry, nearly 3,000 Americans were killed on 9/11. This is not so. Oh, it is the World Trade Center. Over one eighth of the total civilian casualties were citizens of 40 other countries. If you want to take this as an attack on the world, so be it. But it was not nearly 3,000 Americans. It was nearly 3,000 people from the entire world. Okay. Right. You want any websites up for tanks? Yeah, you gotta throw them the towel. Steel. <laughs> Steel. How did this little gram of lead go through this hunk of steel? You don't know because you don't understand it's physics. It's a millimeter, a millimeter, and a half. You don't understand physics. It's all I about don't speed. Much better. Didn't you say I don't know anything about physics? I'm not physics. Don't know anything. Anything. In any case, um, it's all about speed and mass. Speed and mass. Okay. One more time. All right, here we go. Fifteen pounds. Static. Static. Ten pounds. How much does the cup weigh? How much does the cup weigh? Uh, it doesn't matter of what it's made out of. That piece of steel could be a beach ball. But if it weighed that much, it would go through it. It doesn't matter what it's made out of. It's speed. And mass, and that's physics. That's my it time. Thank what you. The cup is made out of? <laughs> it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. <laughs> Speed and mass. On Simple. One pool at a time. Okay. Now, Linson says the evidence is overwhelming. He had the opportunity to ask anything he wanted, any real hard question I couldn't ask. You hear him ask any questions? Really? You had an opportunity to ask anything. You ask any real questions? Why not? The evidence is, evidence is, no, it's my time. The evidence is overwhelming. Why didn't you bring any? They don't have any. Um, nine feet of concrete in the Pentagon. Anyways, that's, you know, that's wrong. The outer wall was reinforced. Concrete, steel, rebar, all that stuff. Each inner wall was just bricks and masonry. So that's false. It was not nine feet of reinforced concrete. There's books you can read about that stuff, actually. Uh, you say I'm not familiar with the firefighters and the stories they told about hearing explosions. No, I said I'm very familiar with that. The difference is the interpretation. They heard what sounded like bombs. You can hear things that sound like bombs, but it ain't. Saying the wings were too weak to go through the building. 200,000 pounds of aircraft, fuel-filled wings, it's going through if it's going 500 miles an hour. You know how silly it is to say planes didn't go in the Pentagon? How many people don't think planes went in the Pentagon? Any hands? Go ahead, raise your hand. One? Oh, so you do believe planes were in the Pentagon. Okay, we're all... Raise your hands there. Okay. One person? So there's two people here that don't believe a plane went in the Pentagon. Into the, uh, excuse me. I meant World Trade Center. Two people in the entire room. That's because everybody saw it, of course. Um, roughly free fall speed, it was a mess the planes, up. please. Um, you know, I can say that I make $100,000 a year and I only make 60000 Well, but I nearly make 100000 Nearly? What's, that's such an opinion. Um, oh, the aluminum found in Indonesia, the plane, 
Personally, it looked like composite to me. But I mean, if it was aluminum, it would have been hollow anyway. Uh, he said the reporters knew what they were looking at when they saw the controlled demolition of buildings. Okay, reporters knew what they were looking at. The experts who run controlled demolition companies, like ProTech, they said, no, it wasn't. The experts say it wasn't. Uh, you know, in the, pen, in the uh, Twin Towers as well, you know there's all kinds of aircraft debris. Geez, the engine went out into the street about 500 feet from the tower. Uh, they found a big punk of the fuselage, landing gears, little pieces. They found debris everywhere. I'll ask you, where did all that debris come from? You're asking I'm asking you. There wasn't a whole lot of debris. There were a couple. Where did the debris come from? There were a couple, three pieces. And That's it. Three, they were, really? They, they were obviously planted. Yes. Okay. There were very few pieces. He thinks there's only three pieces. There were very few pieces. Give us a list of all the pieces. Um, you know, you're giving, you guys are given all kinds of opinions, right? Right. Why didn't you bring evidence? Uh, Judy Woods, now you had your turn to answer well, questions. I brought a bunch of evidence. You're standing up there lying your ass off. Uh, I won't have on time. Shut up! I'm down. Okay, well. anyways, um, let's see. Oh, you said that I denigrate people and veterans. I'm not the one calling for the arrest of people who disagree with you. I'm not either. Uh, Judy Wood, what she believes in, by the way, is a directed energy beam, and it justified the buildings. People don't understand what it takes to put a laser beam up into space. We don't have the capability. They barely have a plane, the entire plane, like a 747 size, with batteries and laser equipment to put a hole in a satellite. To put a little hole in a satellite. That's all. Like, there is not enough directed energy in space to do what she thinks. Um, the problem with conspiracy theories, you're talking about Putin and Bush and the right state. Yeah, the problem, please, no. the problem is once people start a conspiracy or think of a conspiracy theory, everything becomes a conspiracy theory. It's a rabbit hole you keep going down they into and you can't get out of. They put Putin so Right, but the problem is then everything's a conspiracy. Oh, this happens, so this did too. Michael. Okay. Now, Linson, you see, it was a UFO. Hey, please, let's respect everybody's opinion. One full time, please. Linson, he's more upset at me than a government that would kill 3,000 of its own people, he says. And that shows what a real joke it is. He's a more upset at me because I shouldn't be challenging his worldview. Um, so I'm here because I don't think such things should be unchallenged. It's destroying and tearing apart this country. And we're going to go down because of it. When I first started talking tonight, this was filled with ice. The more you look into conspiracy theories, the more they just melt away. People refuse to look at the facts. Hey, you guys had a chance to ask questions, real questions, but did you? Did you come Show to my last you. presentation? Did you come to my last presentation? Directed energy justification, yes. Did you come to my last presentation? Yes. No, no my last one, I had two. Oh, I, no, I, could, I can't. The first one I live in Rockton. I'm not coming to Chicago yes, every week. There's a lot of good evidence. No. Jamie Hill of Oh, look. Uh, there's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of out opinions. Of order. Anyways, there's a. Uh, you guys really want to learn about this stuff. I brought a DVD with different videos. You want to learn things. But the conspiracy mind is closed. They will not be distracted by the facts. No, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. So, so you think thanks for having me. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. 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 No, I, 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 uh, I, 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 Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>